A warm welcome to all World Bioeconomy Forum followers from all over the globe. Today, we are very honored to have Professor Dr. Hans Otto Perkner to join us to talk about the latest report on climate change from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, a very important instrument. The professor is co-chair of the IPCC's Working Group 2. Professor Pertner is also currently professor and head of the Department of Integrative Ecophysiology at the Alfred Wegener Institute for Marine and Polar Research in Germany. The IPCC was created in 1988 by the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, and the United Nations Environment Programme, UNEP. The objective of the IPCC is to provide governments at all levels with scientific information that they can use to develop climate policies. The IPCC reports are also a key input into international climate change negotiations. Professor Pertner, great to have you with us and welcome. Yeah, thanks a lot, my pleasure. Excellent. Um, I think we'll go straight in with some questions. Um, I, I have to say, first of all, um, I looked at your uh, your biography and your CV, and I think if I was to read it out completely, it would probably take about an hour because that's <laughs> you've done a lot of work, a lot of work there. So I think, first of all, can you tell us about your uh, your work on research in your career and then tell us a bit more about your role as co-chair of Working Group 2 for the IPCC? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that question. Certainly, I, I came into uh, the topics that are covered by the IPCC from the side of my own research in marine uh, ecosystems, trying to understand how how marine animals uh, specialize on different climate zones. But my interest certainly goes beyond the and always went beyond the marine because I'm an animal physiologist. Uh, with an interest in cause and effect understanding of what the um, what the environment means, um, how organisms have to um, adapt and how they are challenged by environmental uh, changes. And this is exactly what uh, what climate change um, does. So in in the marine realm, we were comparing um, animals from different climate zones. And uh, we were looking at how they specialize on different temperature regimes uh, from the temperate uh, and tropical to, to the polar and seeing how, how the thermal specialization is influencing how these organisms live. And, and this comes together with insight how CO2, that is a key driver in climate change, is actually influencing these organisms. In the ocean, this means they're uh, exposed to ocean acidification as the CO2 causes, uh, causes the pH, which is a measure of the acidity to, to fall and, and uh, challenges their physiology, especially capacity of calcium carbonate shell formation in, in systems like coral reefs or just simply in bivalves and snails and so forth. And then there is oxygen. Oxygen is an issue in the ocean with warming uh, we are losing um, oxygen uh, pro progressively. There's enhanced stratification, which strengthens the oxygen minimum zone. So this is roughly the, the sort of complexity out of which I moved into, uh, first of all, preparing chapters on ocean systems and climate change um, impacts on ocean systems for the IPCC, leading those chapter teams. And then in the last assessment cycle, at the end, there was the idea, yeah, we could do more. and and maybe in, introduce some of these uh, uh, thinkings also uh, more broadly and also into the terrestrial ecosystems, which are, I think, uh, also at, uh, in, in the core interest of, of the bioeconomy uh, forum. Um, but I, there are certainly human uses also of the ocean and of, of the ocean ecosystems with an interest to uh, use so sustainably. So that's where I see the connection. I'm, I also have ties uh, with uh, the, the Biodiversity Panel, which is a oh. sister organization of the IPCC. Uh, we had a, the first ever official collaboration uh, mid of last year and published a report on, on that. And that has actually also been considered in the preparation of our working group uh, to um, report which was released in the end of February of, of this year. So 
quite a complex enterprise and it's, mm. it's a time eating enterprise i can i can tell you and it's uh, uh but it's 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 so very useful and important i think to uh bring the scientific knowledge to the fore and inform policy and society with respect to where we should be headed in the future and mm. the, the situation is is challenging we we are living uh in a situation where it's very urgent to take sufficient action on mitigation on nature protection on by sustainable use to turning to sustainable uses of of mm. the biosphere and stop uh, the era of over exploitation yeah 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 fascinating fascinating um background that you have there so so what would you say in a sentence to climate change skeptics now what would you actually say well they have missed uh, some important information otherwise they wouldn't be uh, skeptics i mean we clearly yeah. live in a time where we get a, a more and more in-depth understanding of how climate how biodiversity and how human society are intertwined ecosystems can uh, exist uh, without the human species but the human species cannot exist without healthy ecosystems we are dependent um, on the services that these ecosystems uh, provide be it clean air be it clean water be it coastal protection and and so forth and healthy soils are the basis of food production and and biodiversity is uh, so meaningful in in uh, in keeping all of the functioning in those those ecosystems so i mean just saying we are skeptical about whether climate change happens they haven't understood what the use of fossil fuels means in in yeah. earth history on the time scale of earth history and then they haven't understood what uh the whole how the whole planet is functioning great excellent thank you um moving on to the next question uh the IPCC has already issued two reports this year, the first in February on impacts, adaption and vulnerability, and the second on just the 4th of April, stating that the time for action is now and with the notion that we can halve emissions by 2030. As co-chair of the IPCC, how do you see the progress of this ambitious target of the Paris Agreement? Well, very briefly said, we have these nice, nice goals that have been agreed in the policy arena um, with in the Paris Agreement, the IEG biodiversity targets. Um, we have these goals, yes, and they are nice to follow. And there's also been a, a discussion of the time uh, scales uh, and how this should proceed. But we are far from keeping to these goals. And that is, um, we are having a huge implementation gap. So um, implementation means we are slow, too slow in mitigating, in, in reducing climate change and or you know, stopping it um, by, by a certain time. We are not um, uh, in, on the time, um, well, we are not following um, the, the steps that we need to, need to be following to keep to time. And, and also with respect to the biodiversity targets, we are falling behind so that's where the big challenges are the implementation uh, of of what we've had uh, what we've had agreed on um, at the international level yeah so uh, professor what do you think is stopping this um, this why is it taking such a long time i think we um we don't have everybody on on board yet and we have um Key people that are missing still, and and uh, and and people and people that are defining the policies of of their countries and thus are tying themselves to past uh, economic models and and interests. Um, we have uh, wrong priorities. Um, we are subsidizing the use of fossil fuels still more than uh, the implementation of of renewables. Mm. Uh, we we have not understood um, the climate and biodiversity crisis sufficiently as an existential crisis for humankind. What it entails, we're currently seeing in India with the heat wave developing uh, mm. developing there and its its impacts. With we are seeing increasing extreme events and and their impacts. So and and I think part of this is uh, siloed thinking. I mean, we are mm. not operating the and not. 
managing the world based on a whole world understanding in how the natural and the human world need to come together. Mm. Yeah, yeah, makes real sense. Um, in your opinion, practically, what more could be done to, to, to speed up efforts? To speed up efforts, I think there, um, there is always a question of what we need to be doing first and what we need to be uh, doing second. And that mm. is something setting priorities in, in our actions sounds reasonable, but, but we have reached a time where we have to start action in many, many different sectors. So all elements of, of public bureaucracy um, need to uh, be engaged and they need to talk to each other and need to understand um, each other. First of all, we need to remove, I mean, there are some low hanging fruit we can do um, and, and implement in, in order to, um, to start the process and start it at the, at the rate that is needed in order to reach the climate targets. And uh, for example, removing those subsidies and redirecting the financial flows accordingly. I mean, preventing anybody investing into the exploration of fossil uh, fuel, that, that's one thing, that, that's a big step. So we need a mix of improving the understanding of people, closing the education gap, uh, starting with the young generation. But I mean, those who are in responsible positions also need to be in, informed and, and the outreach mechanisms of IPCC and IPBES are there, but they're not sufficient. NGOs, all of civil society need to engage in that. All, everybody who has understood, like the Bioenergy Forum, um, everybody who has understood that this is a, a, a ch an existential challenge should, should join uh, that, that in initiative. And, mm. and abandon the siloed thinking is, is I think, mm. a, a very important approach. Um, there is a tendency among policymakers that, that they solve problems with a relatively short-term perspective. Mm -hmm. So if there's a crisis development, there are some short-term measures, but then the long-term implications are not sufficiently uh, considered. In our working group uh, report, we uh, proposed a gen general concept called climate uh, resilient development. And this, this concept tells us that we are moving over time uh, and having decision points over time where we have the choices, where we have choices to be made. We either move towards um, resilient systems and, and, and constrain our decisions that way, or, and what is currently happening in the, in the context of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian crisis, we make, we use the old recipes. Yeah. For example, we, we have um, a situ situation currently where people are discussing to intensify agriculture in Europe in order to compensate for the uh, losses in, in wheat production in, in Ukraine. But uh, w they are doing it in considering, oh, we, we, are, we still have some natural places that we could cultivate and uh, so forth. And this is the wrong direction. We have an overuse of our land based on mass animal production and uh, based on uh, excessive meat production in the, in the European population. I'm just taking Europe uh, out at, at this point. And we have to reduce meat consumption largely, some people say by 75, 80, 80% 80 in order to reduce the impact of agriculture systems on, on climate, because mm -hmm. without doing that, we will never keep to the 1.5 degree target. Yeah. And at the same time, if we do that, if we move to plant-based diets, we will be supporting a healthier human population mm. because eating too much meat is not good for you. No. And, and at the same time, we will be freeing land that we can use for plant uh, uh, production and, and we can also use for bio, biodiversity restoration, restoration of natural ecosystems and their services. So it's a beneficial move over reducing over exploitation and moving to a sustainable uh, system uh, makes um, makes a lot of sense, but we see the inertia because we are kind of we we think meat production is part of our our wealth and our rights, mm. and and um, we need to develop that kind of understanding that we are on the wrong track in that respect in our mm. societies. Yeah, yeah. Um, you did touch on the Ukrainian situation. Um, obviously, war cannot be good for climate change. Uh, any, any further comments on that? 
well, it, it also tells that, uh, um, that we have policymakers on the planet who just have the wrong uh, priorities. We, we should understand ourselves as a, as a global uh, community and where we join our forces to solve our global problems. And with the human population on the planet being, being so large, um, the, you know, somebody uh, falling out of this and, and just pursuing imperial interests um, uh, is, is just does not make sense anymore. This is kind of falling out of the time and is mm. ignoring completely um, the, the needs that our species currently has. Yeah, absolutely. Like going back to the Stone Age, really. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Let's move on to uh, my next question here, which is um, at the World Bioeconomy Forum this year, we will be addressing the role of the bioeconomy and bioproducts in relation to climate change mitigation. How do you see the interconnection? Uh, do you think it exists at all? What are your own thoughts on the power of the bioeconomy and climate change mitigation? I think this is a very crucial um, link in, in connecting, again, at the interface between the human and uh, world and the, and the biosphere and, and considering the dependence of the human, of human society on functioning ecosystems. So if su sustainability is a leading principle in the bioeconomy, it, it makes a lot of sense um, to, to develop models where nature can be used sustainably to support <clears throat> mitigation. The, the term nature-based uh, solutions uh, come, comes to mind where we are strengthening those ecosystems that store carbon Carbon rich ecosystems exist on land, they exist in the ocean, and they, they exist even in areas, managed ecosystems where healthy soils would store more car carbon than degraded, overexploited uh, soils. So moving towards health for ecosystems and the planet is, is should be an important part of, of bioeconomic considerations. And there are many places on the planet where bioeconomy is already and is an essential element in supporting livelihoods. But many of these livelihoods uh, do not know the line between, mm. uh, between or from where, where we abandon the, the sphere of sustainability and go to, uh, go to ex exploitation. I mean, cutting down rainforests and replacing rainforests with uh, soy mon monocultures on large areas is is removing the capacity of an important system for the global uh, for the for the global climate, and it is uh, uh, replacing biodiversity with a monoculture system, and and this this is not sustainable. So as part of this approach, um, developing the bioeconomy and being creative about doing that. Um, should come with the idea that the strengthening of biodiversity, sustainable uses of the of the land and and the ocean, and sustainable livelihoods for the human population should go hand in hand. And the spatial planning is a very important part of this because we are on the verge of overusing the space that is available on this planet for for this, and and this is constraining the biosphere so much that the uh, sustainability is is lost. Uh, so we need to protect and conserve. We need to restore ecosystems. We, we need to uh, um, develop them. And, and the idea is that we are having is that we are developing a mosaic of protected spaces mm -hmm. to give nature its own right. We have a mosaic of, of sustainable use spaces. There are corridors between those, co corridors also between the protected spaces where species can move according to the, the changing climate. This is already on, ongoing. And then we have spaces which are intensively used by the human population, but still we can maintain biodiversity and ecosystem services in those areas. Green cities mm. are an important picture. Um, mm. Agriculture in cities is, is happening and is mm. a picture for the, for the future. Mico, mixing ecosystem components with uh, human uses is is an important vision and has been around in in traditional cultures. So restore some of the restoration effort could well be like in Europe could well be uh, restoring old uh, cultural uh, landscapes 
um, mm. for example, agroforestry, where um, under a changing climate, um, the, the forests help us to, uh, to protect the, the land from uh, excessive uh, heat and, and, and sun exposure, uh, uh, protect the crops from, from heat stress at the same time, um, the forests, um, as we learn from, from the tropical rainforest, for example, play an important role in global climate regulation, stabilizing the climate. So this is, you know, the holistic picture that I mean, where we can move towards uh, sustainability. But again, the foundation is, is an in-depth understanding that this is an existential necessity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, very comprehensive answer. Um, my final question to you here now is uh, you'll be giving a keynote speech at our forum, which will be held in uh, the um, in Ruka in Finland in September. And um, you'll also be taking part in a panel discussion. Um, what are your expectations of the forum for 2022, where we're concentrating on bio uh, economy and uh, climate change? Well, I think that um, elaborating on, on some of the principles that I've just been describing in, in uh, um, emphasizing the interactions be between systems where we are currently seeing this imbalance coming out of the um, excessive use of fossil fuels, the overuse of the biosphere, its stress that it develops under climate change and what it needs to get out of that situation and, and stabilize the climate, uh, not only in order to minimize the or reduce the impacts of extreme events on the human population, but also reduce um, the impacts of climate on the biosphere, because many of the services that the biosphere provides are being suppressed by uh, climate moving out of the uh, current or well of the past we must uh, we must already say temperature window that has for example characterized the Holocene the period where the human civilization evolved and where the human species has has colonized virtually all corners of of the planet I mean this is to, to elaborate these interactions and what it needs to stabilize those and, and really strengthen the positive interactions and, and push back on the destructive ones. That will be important because that is also an important precondition for a, a stable and sustainable bioeconomy, very clearly. Mm. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much for your time. That has been a, a fascinating interview. And, um, and, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks a lot for your positive uh, feedback. And, and I'm looking forward to the forum and, and to talk more about these issues. Excellent. Thanks. And see you in Ruka. See you in Ruka. Take care. Thanks thank a you. Bye-bye.